Okay, let me stick with whatever I written down there. So let's say that I am trying to build an intrusion detection system, right? I, I'm I'm trying to protect my computer network. So I'm going to be looking at all the packets that are coming into my network. I'm going to say, okay, all these packets are fine. These packets are not. Throw them out. Block them, right? I I want to build a system like this, right? And then uh, so I deploy your system in the IIT network for the first 15 days of a month, okay? I know it will crash, everything will be everything will be malicious or whatever, but let us say let's, 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 let's in, a, in an ideal world and then it catches like 84 percent of the malicious traffic okay? and then from 16th to 30th I deploy his system, okay? it catches 87 percent of the malicious traffic. Is this system better than yours? Aha, uh -huh. when can you say that? Can you say something more than it depends? That is what we are going to do now. Looking, that's what that's, we are just going to look at a formal way of trying to say how sure you can be his system is better than your system. That is essentially what hypothesis testing lets you do. Okay. It looks at the underlying data distribution that you are operating with and it should be able to tell you that okay, with uh, some confidence his system is better than your system. Okay. Typically what we do in hypothesis testing, we set a confidence level a priori. Okay. So unless with 95 percent confidence you can tell me that his system is better than his system, I am not willing to buy it. I right? am just going to consider they are all the same system. I need at least 95 percent confidence for his system to be better, only then I will accept it. Otherwise, I am not going to accept it because there is so much variability in the, uh, in the, in the whole process that 95 percent is something which I can be comfortable with. People usually ask for 99, right? people usually ask for 99 percent. Uh, confidence because of the, uh, the because the inherent uncertainty in the whole thing. So that is essentially what we are going to look at. So how can we set up experiments okay, so that we can answer such questions. But before that we really need to know what experiments we need to set up. Right. So like I already gave you two examples, right? I said that your system is better than his system, that is the first question, right? is your system better than his system. Then the second question, is your system better than his system under high load? What do you mean by high load? Into intrusion detection, right? so traffic, lot of traffic is coming. Right? So instead of, so maybe your system is, uh, is not very different from his system when the traffic is 10 Mbps. Right? The traffic is 1 Gbps, maybe you start becoming better than him. Right? Maybe yours is a lighter system, therefore you are able to respond faster and then his system starts dropping packets because of the heavy load. So that could be a question, right? that, that could very well be the thing. So, but then you have to think about it, right? you have to figure out hey what is happening and then you can basically what you do in such cases is you observe the, observe the system, like you have to make some kind of exploratory behavior and then you have to say okay, the mean number of packets I let through when it is at 10 Mbps is the same for both guys but the mean, but whatever some rough estimate I have seems to be slightly different when it is 1 Gbps. Maybe I should run a more careful test and figure out which, is, which one is different, right? whether, whether, whether it is with a high confidence whether it is different or not, right? so that is the things. Right? And there are other things which I could do, right? I can say that your algorithm is better when you run it with this parameter setting as opposed to that parameter settings. When, when I say the parameter is theta 1 versus the, when I say the parameter is theta 2, right? your algorithm is better when it is theta 1 versus when it is theta 2, so that is another question to ask. Or your algorithm is better than his algorithm when you use theta 1. So when do you, how do you get to these questions? Right. So that is where our exploratory analysis comes in. Right. So you have to do some amount of exploration with the data. You have to talk to an expert, right, who understands this. You have to ask him, hey, by the way, will theta being theta one versus theta two, will it actually make a change to the performance? Right. And that guy might say, hmm, okay, yeah, maybe. So maybe you shouldn't throw out all the packets which are having parameter theta 2, maybe you should include them, right? so maybe that, I mean that could be something, right? so you can do all kinds of things. So some of the simple things you do are, well, you could do clustering, right? so what would clustering help you to find? <coughs> it is 
it helps you find how the data is clumped up, right. When you do clustering, you can figure this out, right. You can figure out whether the data is coming from a single distribution or whether it is coming from a mixture distribution because you will find different clumps of data corresponding to the same class, right. So now this will allow you to tailor your classification choices accordingly, right. So this is one thing that you could uh, hope to get, right. In some cases, in, uh, in fact, um, people use clustering to even generate the labels. So I will give you a lot of data, right. I do not know, I, I have not labeled the data into anything, right, but I can do clustering, I can figure out which are the major clusters and then okay, there are three kinds of people in my customer base, okay. Now I can build a classifier that will predict which of these, when a new customer comes in, I can make, I can have it predict which one, which category he belongs to, so those kinds of things, right. So I want to get some rough idea of the frequency of occurrences of features in my data, right. I can do some kind of simple binning on the features and I can build histograms that allow me to understand how often some things uh, occur. So if the data is concentrated, suppose I do this thing and then I find that only some bins in the histogram have very large numbers. That essentially means the, even though my, the feature can span a very large uh, range, it is only some very small values are actually present in the data. So these kinds of observations I can make, right. So this will, this will essentially help me do those kinds of things, right. And then I can do simple regression fits. <coughs> I can do simple regression fits and figure out if there is any trend to the data already, right, that lets me do, uh, figure out whether I should be using a linear classifier or whether I should be doing something else, whether the data is more complex, right. And we already talked about correlation analysis, you should do correlation analysis for what? For throwing away features, right. We already talked about it. if the two features are highly correlated, you should throw them away because otherwise it will lead to numerical instability in many of your algorithms, right. So apart from that, uh, you can actually use this correlation analysis to figure out what are the kinds of questions to ask as well, right? think about it, right. So once I know what is the hypothesis to test, right, once I know what is the hypothesis to test, then I have to set up a proper experiment. So I have to set up a proper experiment. So here I have to be very careful about, right, what is the question I am asking and which of the variables in the system, okay, are important for the question that I am asking. Which of the variables in the system are important for the question I am asking. So for example, let us stick with our intrusion detection system. So I want a good intrusion detection system to have a high throughput, right. So as and when the things come in, I should should be able to put it out, right? It should have a high throughput. Let us say I want to test the throughput alone. Okay, I am not interested in the accuracy or anything. I just want to make sure that the traffic is not being delayed by the inserting the system. So I can take this throughput I can take throughput as the variable of interest, right? Or if you are looking at classification accuracy, I can take classification accuracy as my variable of interest, okay. This is essentially known as the the dependent variable, right. There could be more than one dependent variable that you are interested in, okay. Then I would have There are many independent variables, right. It could be the parameter theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, it could be something else, right. If we are talking about throughput, it could be something like a buffer size, right. Uh, or if I am talking about classification accuracy, it could be, right, a variety of different uh, parameters, right. So these are all independent variables of, of interest, right. 
So independent variables could be something like buffer size traffic profile and so on so forth right and then there might be other variables okay called extraneous variables right um, Right. So, for example, time of day. Right. So, time of day can actually affect the network traffic significantly, but there is nothing I can do about it. Right. And more people are awake in the morning, and they'll be doing something in the morning. And well, more people are awake in the night, and they'll be doing something in the night. And more people are less people are awake in the morning, or they are in classes. Okay. Huh? So that will affect the traffic. Right. Maybe that is not something I can control, right? So I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about it. But what I do is, whenever I do a comparison between algorithm A and algorithm B, I only do it during daytime or nighttime, right? So whatever these extraneous variables are, I will control for them in the sense that I'll make sure that they are the same, right? Even though I can't independently set it to whatever value I want, I'll make sure that they are the same so that. They do not affect the outcome of my experiment. Okay, so there are extraneous variables for which we should control for. Okay, does it make sense? Right. So these are the three things that we should look at. Right. So there are dependent variable, independent variable, and then extraneous variable, which we should make sure we are we are controlling against. Okay. Okay, great. And there could be other variables in the system, right? Like temperature, pressure, humidity, and all that, which doesn't really affect your network thing, does it? Maybe it does. If it's very hot, people don't less less likely to sleep in the night, right? Maybe you should control for that as well. <laughs> Do this only on hot days or cold days. Okay, in Madras, the second doesn't exist, uh, but. Uh, yeah. So, so that's essentially how to set up the proper experiment, making sure you know what are the variables you are paying attention to. So, I mean, all of this is very basic, fundamental stuff, which you should, all of you should learn in a proper design of experiments course. Right. Once you have set up this experiment, right, you have to make sure you are avoiding any kind of spurious effects. What do you mean by spurious effects? The people know the floor effect and the ceiling effect. Floor effect, as in math. <laughs> Close enough. So, <laughs> so suppose suppose I, I I'm setting up an experiment to measure whether his algorithm is better than his algorithm, right? So and then uh, let's say throughput again. Let's take throughput and uh, the traffic is flowing in at 10 Mbps, right? And your algorithm lets the traffic through at 10 Mbps. How can you hope to beat him? Match. Match, you can, but you can't beat. So I don't know if it's better or not, right? So both of you can at best achieve 10 Mbps. This is called the ceiling effect. So you might be capable of achieving 30 Mbps, but I don't know that because 10 Mbps is all that is there in the system. So this is called the ceiling effect. So likewise, the floor effect is at the other end of it, right? So one of the, I mean, the, so I learnt all of this in actually uh, 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 empirical methods course when I was doing my uh, PhD long time back, right? But uh, the person who taught it was a very strong believer in avoiding ceiling effects. So he used to set question papers, which could never be completed in the time allotted for them. <laughs> so there are no ceiling effects, right? <laughs> So there's always, if, if you are good and you finish the question paper early, I mean, if you finish 10 questions early, there's always another question for you to attempt, right? So people typically end up, I mean, even the best person ends up finishing about 75% of his paper. So you can see he's an incurable optimist, right? I mean, <laughs> but he just wanted to make sure that uh, there is no, no ceiling effect, 
yeah so yeah and likewise there are uh, order effects you know the order in which you actually test things could matter uh, so one example is um, uh, not exactly in experimentation but uh, it's a very interesting effect that i thought i'll mention right so when you when you are bargaining you are trying to bargain with somebody so the first thing that you put on the table right uh, actually determines the, uh, the path in which it's going to go right suppose you want to you, somebody is trying to sell you something the first thing you should go if you go and tell him okay i'll pay you 10 rupees for it now he's going to feel a little bit bad about asking you for 50000 rupees <laughs> right you know this uh, this uh, it actually happens when you bargain in bombay okay if you let that guy first give you the money he'll say 50000 rupees no you are going to feel bad about asking him for 10 rupees <laughs> right so <laughs> So once I went with a friend of mine, so he, he took us to some shop and there was this thing, he said, the guy said, what is this thing? He said, okay, it's 3,000 rupees. I said, no, no, I'll give you 15 rupees for it. <laughs> no, that guy, no, no, that guy actually bargained with us, you know. <laughs> so we ended up buying it for something like 55 rupees or something. You know? <laughs> so, so order, <laughs> order effects matter, right? So this is not really that, but uh, depending on uh, which order you make measurements in, Right. Um, uh? Yeah. I mean, there are other examples I can give, but I thought this will be more funny. Anyway, so so those are things which you should avoid. And there's a third thing which you should very 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 careful to avoid is sampling bias. Right. Suppose I want to know <coughs> whether uh, algorithm A is better or algorithm B is better in playing a particular game. Okay. Then I I I I, I look at the average moves that were taken across games that were won right and then i find that there is no statistical difference between algorithm a and algorithm b right both algorithm a algorithm b win in similar number of moves right but i did a very big cardinal sin i made a sampling bias here i only picked the games which both of them won right so a1 b1 so essentially these probably are simpler games <coughs> right both of them won and I am comparing them and so they all won in similar number of moves. I should actually be looking at all the games that they played, right? How many they won, how many they lost. So all of those uh, things I should be comparing. So I have to be making sure that the sample on which I am running these experiments are not biased in any particular way, okay? It is very important. Um, in fact, uh, quite often when uh, people do all these phone-in surveys and things like that, right? There is always this criticism about uh, doing phone-in surveys. Like when somebody calls you and says, okay, are you going to vote for Modi or uh, Rahul Gandhi in the next election, <laughs> right? Uh, so you, you give some answer, right? So why is this a bad survey to run? You ask only those people who have phones. You ask only those people who have phones who are most likely not going to vote. So. <laughs> So that's a different issue, but you're asking people who have phones, right? You're essentially skewing your sampling. So you can say anything you want, right? I, I managed to control for uh, income level. So I only ask people who make so much money, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. But then that still means you're leaving out a whole set of people with the same income level who don't have phones, I mean, right? So I mean, you could have very low income level and still have phones nowadays, right? So that has no correlation to uh, having phone. Maybe it has correlation to how much you waste on the phone. But uh, but <coughs> mere possession of a phone no longer has a correlation with many of the demographic factors. But still, there is something very <coughs> selective about only calling people who have phones, right? So in India, any any meaningful survey should be done door to door or <coughs> street to street and so on and so forth. But that, that's, there are complaints. But you see, many of the surveys that people put in all your magazines and things like that are mostly phone in surveys, even uh, in, in, in even in India. So in US, it doesn't make a sense. It doesn't make a difference because every household needs to have a phone, right? And the, the number of people who are, don't live in households is small. In India, that's not the case, <coughs> right? So these are these are sampling bias. So these things enter very very uh, often. Uh, we don't even think about it. We don't even think a second time about all the sampling bias that we introduce. Okay. So I'll stop here. <coughs>